sugar and carbohydrates are not the same and sugar and glucose are not the same. And one of the biggest myths in nutrition in general is that carbohydrate equals sugar. If carbohydrates are getting me out of this really terrifying place, it's very easy to overeat them. And what happens then is blood sugar can skyrocket. It can hang there for a while. Now you've gone really high. Now you're chasing your tail to try to correct this blood sugar back down. And the cause and effect of that is often resentment toward the food that is the problem in the first place. We're back for part two of our Carb phobia, which I mean, we were just talking about cat barf. So, I mean, that's enough to make us afraid of any food. <laughs> yes. And, you know, believe it or not, folks, they really do not eat any carbohydrates, cats, as they're uh, obligate carnivores, certainly, which is one of those things that we think about probably as, as chosen herbivores. But I always think of this as my choice is my choice and I do not share a plate with my cats and my cats are born into their biology and I have chosen mine. So, and I certainly didn't choose, I certainly didn't choose type one, but I get to choose how I treat it. So, um, yeah, a lot to think about there. Right. But, uh, yeah, we've got, we've got more to deliver on these carbs. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so much, um, you know, just in reflection on our conversation that we had the other day, um, you know, some things that we maybe wanted to expand on more or touch on that we didn't have a chance to talk about the last time. And a couple of those things were, you know, the influence of external information on our dietary choices or dietary um, you know, knowledge, where we, where we get our knowledge about our di- dietary choices. And that's really interesting, especially with, you know, of course, we all are using and accessing social media. Social media is very present in all of our lives to some degree. Um, there's a lot of media influences as to what may, might, might make us drawn to or thinking about the types of foods we're eating. Um, there's also, um, you know, you were talking about some other um, falling out of my head. It's like falling out of my head right now. <laughs> food rules. Food, food rules. rules. Yeah. Titles and labels. Um, the the mm-hmm. misleading, the misleading fad diet marketing, um, the stuff that automatically just pops up in front of you that's telling you to buy a what you can tell is a very restrictive program that is already, you know, already laying down the rules about what you can and cannot do in it with within it. And it's it's part of the um, particular angle on carbohydrates are the source of everyone's problem or something or another, and, and what is the source of that? And that was also something we talked about within the relationship between diabetes and carbohydrates. It's complicated when carb control is emphasized at the moment of diagnosis. So what do we tend to do? We go looking for additional information if we didn't get it at the time. We're looking for more. We're seeking. We're looking, which is great. We all want to be able to access great information and great education. But once you start to Google, guess what happens? An algorithm decides what you're going to see. It decides and it puts it in front of you. So unless you're really specific and you have healthy, positive, body positive, good attitude sources about eating whole foods, whole plant foods, you may find yourself in a pretty, pretty sticky area deep water quick. Yeah, of course. It's so true. And like sometimes, do you ever have that experience where like you're talking about something with a friend and then the next day, like something pops up that you were just talking about? Like I was talking about gardening or like um, getting some garden, getting some seeds or something or, or, you know, planting seeds for this upcoming season. And next thing I know, I'm getting like advertised to, you know, certain things. So, so it just is so suspicious of like, exactly to your point, the algorithms and the, you know, maybe I did type something into a browser, but also I was talking about it with a friend and then all of a sudden it's like popping up in my feed, like, Hey, buy these seeds. (laughs) So you're right. We're, we're products of our own, our own search engines. And we are, I mean, that's that whole idea of the social dilemma, right? So like if we're already being influenced by our healthcare team at the time of diagnosis, we're being told to eat low carbohydrate, then we start searching for low carbohydrate low carbohydrate meals or options, then it may, that's all, you're going to continue to receive that type of information coming back at you. Um, so that's really an interesting topic and one that we can't ignore because it's 
part of our lives. Yeah. You know, it really is. It's part of the, this is our, this is our tech talk of the day, right? Ah, like this is a little bit of tech talk. <laughs> yeah. Let yeah. me, okay. Let me inject a, a little phrase I like to use about that. And it's, um, information digestion and digestion is connection. We are super connected, that information that we're digesting. And if anybody can take a moment, if you're scrolling right now, taking a moment and just think, how is this directing my attitude right now? How is this making me feel about myself? Am I seeking something? If you wake up in the morning and you see something right away, um, there's reasons why I have to stay off LinkedIn. There are very clear reasons why I should. Let me say should. Stay off LinkedIn. The moment I open it up, I see a colleague in the diabetes world just boasting about all the medications that people with diabetes should be taking. And that ticks me off. (laughs) So I have to create a boundary with that. I have to create those boundaries with myself. So we're thinking about what we're digesting in a number of different ways. Um, It fits right into the carbohydrate conversation because something that we look at as coaches is what aren't you getting? What haven't you been getting? It's just a little bit of the simplification process of choosing those green light foods because we can look at those and think, um, you know, have, have you given yourself permission to eat all of these foods? When the la- when is the last time you felt comfortable eating beans or chili that's rich and barley? <laughs> when is the last time you gave yourself permission? Absolutely. And, you know, I'm glad that you brought it back to the carb talk because I feel like, you know, the social media, all the, all the outside influences can ultimately influence our independent decisions that we make in our kitchen, in our home, at the grocery store, and when we're talking, when we're talking about like introducing more carbohydrate-rich foods into our diet, you know, the question of like, well, how do I do that comes up, but also the question of, is this the right thing? I'm getting all of these sources, all these, all these influences saying, no, don't do that. So you know, finding that um, comfort in your choices, right? Like l- picking a source that you believe and a trusted source. And then finding, um, you know, food options or recipes or things that you want to follow becomes really valuable in this whole process of adding more carbohydrate-rich foods to your diet. And, you know, we were talking about that earlier that like there's um, sometimes too many options out there and that can make things also really overwhelming and doesn't make this process feel easy or simple or as like as you just put it like oh that recipe sounds delicious but it's just too complicated i'm i'm i, I don't know how to make that or it's not something i've made before and i'm not sure how to do that so that idea of you know what does simplification really mean mhm so how if do you're looking that? at Yes. So accomplishing that, if you're looking at a grocery list with 30 different plants on it of some kind, you know, or I should say maybe there's 20 plants on there and 10 different spices and herbs and all of these things that are really kind of like the art of flavoring your plant-based meals is part of the herbs and spices and making it fun. But if you're looking at that and most of these foods are kind of new to you and your kitchen, how do we navigate the overwhelm? How do we limit the the feelings of like, if I don't do all of this, I'm not going to do it right. I think that's a common feeling. I have to do all of it, all or nothing or else. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, yeah. And so the question then is, well, at least for me, and this is what we hear a lot. It's like, well, you know, how do I do this my way, right? How do I do this so that it feels good for me and my family? And, you know, um, if I'm not the all or nothing type of a personality, because a lot of people, that's really, that becomes really overwhelming in itself. Like some people can do that. I, I've worked with a lot of people who they see the meal plan and they're like, great, that's fine. I'm just going to make these things. It's it's fine. I'll do it. <laughs> and I'm like, wow. I mean, I wonder <laughs> right. if they're the type of people who just like get to the edge of the pool and just jump in, right? Head first or feet first. Don't check the temperature. That's just go. Not me. I'm the steps <laughs> person, right? I, yeah. I like to take my time walking down the steps in the pool. Even on the hottest day, I'm like, I'm just going to slowly and gradually work my way in. By the way, Cyrus is the cannonball cannonball type person. He like jumps in with the, in the cannonball. So <laughs> not that anybody was is surprised by that. <laughs> but I also had a vision of the child of sort of like, you know, the young Cyrus here doing something <laughs> similar that she will be, can- she will be cannonball baby when she can, when she can. When she's ready for that. Jump in yes, the pool, when she I can swim. So too. <laughs> I think yeah, so too. Cannonball baby. 
But any, but you know, so when people are, what we found, what we found to be really helpful is that when people, when somebody tells us, Hey, I'm a walk into the pool gradually kind of person. I need to take one step at a time with these carbohydrate rich meals. Um, whether it's because it's just something I'm, I prefer, it's a tolerance, you know, whether it's a digestive issue, right? I'm not tolerating all these carbohydrates, all this fiber right now, um, or the, glu- you know, having some glucose response to the high carbohydrate foods. There's many reasons why somebody would want to take it slowly and, you know, walk down the steps slowly. Mm, I'm agreeing. Yes. It, it, there's no reason that it can't be done that way. And recalling, I didn't know what I was doing at all when the plant-based foods worked. And the beauty with this is that the the proof is in the plants here, is that we know what we're dealing with. We um, understand that uh, glucose, time and range, these are priorities for people. And we're going to watch that at the exact same time as we're going to help to simplify the choices that can feel really overwhelming, but people to, you know, getting buried underneath all this, this, these grocery lists or feeling like I have to do this or not, it's not going to work at all. You have to remove a timeline sometimes and thinking that, you know, you've got one month to fix your A1C. Let's not go there. Um, not, we don't want to look at it that way, but there are small goals to set one day at a time. And sometimes those small goals are, let's just work on one meal this week, one meal. Pick your favorite recipe out of this set of 24 meals, you know, what we'd end up looking at on some kind of a, you know, a structured meal plan. And the beautiful thing ab- about that when you, you know, people can go on YouTube and they see all of these great recipes under Mastering Diabetes or on the website and they see all these great recipes, pick five of your favorite and then cool it. Create yourself a recipe book, but go slow. And that's kind of how I walked into the water, uh, definitely down the stairs. I certainly walked into the water because my insulin sensitivity was coming up so fast that I didn't know what to do. So imagine not having any idea what's going on and you're still going slow. Right. Well, and that's a really big deal for people who, especially if you're somebody who who injects insulin. And if you start gaining insulin sensitivity because your dietary fat starts to decrease quickly and your carbohydrate intake increases quickly, you're going to, it's going to be, you know, you're going to have to lower your insulin as that insulin sensitivity improves, right? You're, you're, and that's something that will catch people off guard as well. And that makes, again, adds another layer of complication and confusion. Like, again, the question mark comes up, well, why is this happening? Now I'm low all the time. That doesn't feel good. This can't be right. When, you know, in this situation, when you eat more carbohydrate rich whole foods from plants, you're actually gaining sensitivity. And so hypoglycemia is an indicator that things are getting better. Right. So obviously hypoglycemia is never a place we it's not a place we want to stay in, but it's a it's an indication that things are getting better in your insulin sensitivity. And therefore it's time to make adjustments. And if you're hypoglycemic frequently and you're taking oral glucose reducing medication or insulin, then it's time to reduce insulin or your medication at some, you know, somewhere. Right. Anything. I'm amazed, Kylie, at how many people over the course of just my career initially as a dietitian, because this comp- this question came up quite a bit, but in the the community workshop I had done over the over this last week on the blue zones, is this came up again where how many people have a goal or a desire to reduce their medications, but they don't think that they can. They don't think it's an option and they don't ask their doctors, hey, I'm not really comfortable going on more medication or I'd like to learn how to reduce this. What are my chances? What else should I know? And there's almost always a, the reply almost always has lifestyle in it. That's, and that's a part of, unfortunately, and maybe in primary care or wherever someone's being seen that there not be, may not be time for that conversation. So owning up to some of that and there's a cause and effect that's kind of interesting in what you mentioned with along the lines of carb phobia. It's the glucose lowering medication, insulin, orals, is a low blood sugar. They can be absolutely terrifying. And what happens, what treats a low, what treats this huge fear is carbohydrates. 
So if carbohydrates are getting me out of this really terrifying place, it's very easy to overeat them. And what happens then is blood sugar can skyrocket. It can hang there for a while. Now you've gone really high. Now you're chasing your tail to try to correct this blood sugar back down. And the cause and effect of that is often resentment toward the food that is causing what is perceived as the problem in the first place. That's the carbohydrates. So in diabetes, carbohydrates can, or food in general, nutrition, carbohydrates, whichever angle we're looking at this is there, it's both the problem and the solution. That is, I mean, mentally wrapping our minds around that. I mean, right. Therapy written all over this, but that is, that's a very, that's a huge challenge to overcome that. And that's where we start working on, well, which foods, which nutrients, what can help me stabilize to tighten up my variability so I have less crashes and less of these really hardcore rebounds. Um, I think, you know, if, if what you've envisioned when you work with people that are trying to reverse insulin resistance because they've been diagnosed with type 2 or prediabetes is, is seeing how there are really beautiful things that can happen when the nutrition starts to change, when the fiber goes up and you get to watch them go, aha, aha, I'm seeing a huge difference here between the high fat, high protein I was doing and just what these three simple meals are starting to teach me. And certainly with insulin dependent, you've got a little different, different things to look for there, but the similarities end up being, um, so wonderful to to watch happen for someone's relationship with food, no matter what the diagnosis is. Yeah. Well, and one thing that we haven't really talked about yet is the idea that also all carbohydrates are not created equal. So when you look at your nutrition label, you know, I, I actually just did a little training on this the other night that you know, all these foods that we buy in the store come with these nutrition labels and they say how many grams of carbohydrate and they even will break down the sugars, right? Like how many sugars, how many grams of added sugar. Sugar and carbohydrates are not the same and sugar and glucose are not the same. And one of the biggest myths in nutrition in general is that carbohydrate equals sugar. And funny enough, we just this morning, we were at a this little cafe in town and they make these amazing like acai fruit bowls. So we go there with our friends and they have other, other things on the menu too, but they happen to have food that like we feel really good about eating. They have smoothies and anyway, um, and Cyrus ordered this huge smoothie bowl with lots of fruit on top. And our friend who's no, you know, they've known us for a while. He basically said, you know, yeah, fruit equals sugar, fruit sugar. Like, how do you eat that? Isn't that, don't you have diabetes? And like, isn't fruit sugar? And I mean, it was one of those things where, is this a teachable moment? Does he really want to listen? Does he really want to know? Or, you know, are we going to go down this route right now? Like, are we really doing this right now? Um, and, but the reality is that unfortunately, especially in diabetes education and health, fruit equals sugar. And that is just false. Because we know that sugar that comes from refined foods, from your, you know, anything that's like a baked good or sugar cookies or, um, you know, adding refined sugar to a meal or to a, something that you're making is a very different molecule and has a very different influence on your body and on your glucose uh, levels than a fruit that is combined with fiber and water and minerals and vitamins and phytonutrients and all of these things that help to slow down the glucose uptake, right? And I think that might be an even bigger thing for us to discuss because that conversation this morning just really made me aware of just how little people really understand about nutrition and about, you know, how nutrient dense fruit this this bowl of food that Cyrus had for his meal and that we you know I had one too how I looked at that as a bowl of energy and nutrients and vitamins and things that were going to help my cells like I just saw it so differently and yet in our general population people automatically look at something like that and think that's just a bowl of sugar. I may as well be eating a bowl of refined sugar and there, there just couldn't be anything further from the truth. <laughs> well, when do we learn the term or when, when, why, how, and where are we going to get the term nutrient density from? That's also a part of it, right? The simplicity of 
it, of wait a second, potatoes are, you know, when it comes to nutrient density, I'm going to feel full on a cup of potatoes, but hold on, they're like 35 grams of carbohydrates. That's that's it. How does that work? But if carbohydrates raise my blood sugar, what do you mean by nutrient density? You know, the the um, less calories here, it, it's not a concept that is as understandable and too much, talk about content, too much gets thrown at one time that some of the simplest ideas get lost on us. Meaning, how could you really look at fruit and think that it's not a good idea? But again, we're tracking blood sugar, right? This is the thing that we're focused on. We're really looking at it. So of course you can be, you get to be concerned about anything you eat that's a carbohydrate, but the idea is learning how to work with it because at the same time, insulin resistance needs to be reduced, but there's a strategy to it. It's not like, all right, head out into the wild and eat all the carbohydrates you can without even thinking about, you know, in fact, I saw a product last week I have to tell you about. I don't know if you've seen this. This is, everybody's going to gasp. They are, it's a can, a 15 ounce can of Dr. Pepper beans. They, they are, I think they're kidney beans with 17 grams per cup. So there's two cups, about two cups in there per serving. So a half cup, um, 17 grams of added sugar in the form of Dr. Pepper, the soda. They're Dr. Pepper wow. beans. They're Dr. Pepper flavored like beans. Soaked in Dr. Pepper? Soaked in Dr. Pepper. And I just, wow. God, now. Huh. What now? You know, we're, come on, don't mess with the beans. I mean, that was just I my know. response to this. <laughs> just would you? They ha- they're just, they have everything they need. Leave them beans don't. alone. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> Nobody needs this. Stop. And seriously, I know. Wow. And it just, it happens to be at this cat sanctuary I volunteer at and I love it so much. So I'm not going to mess with them, <laughs> but they have this thing. Right. I know they have this thing. They're just one of the, one of the founders just loves Dr. Pepper. And because everybody loves the sanctuary and they love her. So they'll send her Dr. Pepper and somebody sent Dr. Pepper beans. And I went, wow. No. Oh no. <laughs> No, 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 no. Oh my gosh. That's so funny. Yeah. 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 You're like, really just leave the beans alone. Like, right. Leave don't. the beans alone. But like, you imagine like, it, this is how the fear with carbohydrates can start is that we, the way that we grow up, we may be growing up with beans in a casserole, having a whole bunch of sugar added to it. So what we think of as beans or what we think of as a, as a whole grain, oh my gosh, like, you know, here, what we've got is like a creamy wild rice soup. It's super high in fat and you know, it's like really thick like cream sauce and the wild rice itself get, gets lost in that really savory feeling but as we know um mastering diabetes has some really awesome recipes with wild rice in them that look awesome with mushrooms and they're super savory so it flips the script so if we're willing to identify the fact that we've gone through a world of that's just major carb phobic because we've been given some wrong perceptions about carbohydrates, what they are and how useful they are. Maybe some of that has to do with how we grew up eating, but being open to flipping things around a little, trying one recipe at a time, try not to get overwhelmed, just enter the world of plants. And if you feel better, we're on to something. That's how we how I simplify is if you feel better, we're on to something. It's a also a little bit like well, the other side of the coin here is the real serious attachment to dairy. When you're high fat, serious attachment to dairy is if you don't think it helps you, if you think that your tummy hurts by consuming dairy, could you just maybe try three or four weeks without it and let's just see if you feel better? Little sacrifice to feel like a million bucks. Yeah. Just think of it that way, you know, think of it differently One thing at a time. Let's yeah. see where we go. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, I like that idea of like the kind of categories of food that you're experimenting with, right? Is what you're suggesting is like, let's just try this without, you know, and especially now with dairy, there's so many non-dairy alternatives for pretty much everything. I mean, not that I'm necessarily going to advocate for non-dairy alternatives for cheese or things like that. Oh, kitty. Sorry. There's a kitty on screen. Yep, right. and this happens to be the one yes. with vomit breath. Oh, and the, now the, she's the puking kitty. Yep, this is Sailor. Um, Everyone meet Sailor's tail. <laughs> oh, she's so sweet. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I'm not a big advocate for any. We, we're not a big advocate for a lot of alternatives that, especially if they contain oil, 
obviously that puts them into our red light category. However, if dairy is a trigger for you and that's a category of food that you can just step away from for a little bit and test it out, see how your body responds. Um, that is such a great one. That's like one thing that you can do to start experimenting with how you're going to feel better. And again, just sort of on the concept of simplicity, you know, mono meals have been one strategy that a lot of people have found to be really, really supportive. There's also no rule that says, hey, plant-based eaters, you have to eat every recipe and you have to eat every every type of food every day, right? If you were to eat a day where you were only eating a certain food that you really love, let's say you just had like a day where you're eating all bananas or all potatoes or or beans or something that, you know, you could test out your blood glucose in isolation of just that food. That can be a really great experiment and also really supportive in terms of decluttering your mind throughout this process. And I've seen it work really well as a tool and a strategy for so many people in our world. And, um, you know, kind of sometimes we just need a little bit of permission to take that space of like, okay, I'm just going to I'm just going to eat beans all day. Great. I love beans. I love lentils. I love black beans. I'm just going to eat beans all day. It's going to be fine. And, you know, if you spend one day only eating one certain type of plant food, first of all, you're still going to have a high nutrient density in your diet, in your intake, right? But you're not going, you're not going to like lose anything in the bigger picture of green light eating because you spent one day eating one food. But it can also be very interesting information for your blood glucose response, for your patterns to look at, well, what happens if I eat... like. For example, what's what's coming up for me is that um, when you were talking about the 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 rice soup, right? There's so many other variables in that soup. In that case, it's the creaminess, the the fat, the high fat from the you know the cream or the milk. But if you're looking at um, a lot of different types of carbohydrates in one meal, isolating the variable and picking one of those foods and just working with that for a day or two can actually give you really good um, understanding of your blood glucose response to that particular food. Some foods that come up in that category be like starches, especially like the starchier foods can be a little bit more, um, you know, can cause a little more blood glucose variability. So. Yeah. And there's a lot of people that I've, that I've worked, you know, people that have busy lives that have, no matter what they eat, they've, they've figured out how to work with their commute or work with their, the time they go to the gym, the time they're actually working, they're very routine people and they like it. And they've decided I can eat the same thing every day and be okay with it, particularly Monday through Friday, if that's how work goes. And that honestly, like as a coach, that makes things easy on me. I mean, just knowing like, Hey, cool. We've got an experiment here. Let's see. What do you want to work with? There can be a little bit of what I can call like a protein flip, meaning, oh, you're used to eating um, you know, chicken, ve- chicken and veggies and rice for dinner. Well, we're going to flip the protein around. We're going to add some beans in here. We're going to jazz this up a little bit to give you more color in that meal. Talk about nutrient density. We're actually going to have more food for you to eat. If you like it, can you repeat it? So you find meals you love so that you can eat the same thing for a couple of weeks. And if it works, it works. And that is one of the easiest ways to be able to nail things down. Increase your sensitivity, finding some consistency. If things are inconsistent, you know what they say in type 1 diabetes is inconsistency is our consistency. That is our constant, right? And okay, so if you have a goofy day, if you've got some hormones running through you that you can't measure, you know, blood sugar variability gets a little bit interesting at certain times um, for everyone because stress, life, that can change our blood sugar. But if we've been eating in a way that we are so used to and we can predict it so well, I think it really helps people forgive themselves if they have a bad day, because what we know isn't responsible for a glucose doing something unpredictable is the food. If we've gotten so good at understanding how that food works. Okay. Well, did you have an injection go wrong? Did you get super stressed out? Do you think you're getting sick? Blood sugars can go, can really elevate before a cold is present. <laughs> so that's a big area of frustration for people also. Um, but, uh, but yeah, the element of forgiveness while you're changing your eating habits is super important or that 
phobia towards these new foods or different foods and the fear that comes along with it, it's going to stick around until we deal with that. For sure. Yeah. And, and also, you know, there is a little bit of um, trusting of the process. You know, if you're, if you've, if you're tuning in here and you're, and you're already experimenting and, you know, maybe trying some things on and you're, you're feeling like, wow, this isn't really working, or I'm noticing these changes in my blood glucose, you're not alone. I mean, there is variability that comes with this process. You know, there's, there's some noise as insulin sensitivity improves and the noise comes from, you know, just that background insulin resistance that can cause more elevations in blood glucose. And the funny thing is that the answer is that you get to kind of eat your way out of it through the green light foods, which are high in carbohydrate. And it does take some time. It can take some time. Um, we, it can also be um, if you if you have the fortitude to do an all in type of approach, it can also be very obvious very quickly that this is going to work if you can kind of take a couple of days off and just focus on eating green light foods for three or four days. Um, especially in the raw form, raw food, raw f- food from fruits and vegetables specifically, it, it's a way to re- gain so much insulin sensitivity by eating raw food. We do raw food challenges within our coaching program a couple times a year because raw food eating can just be so insulin sensitizing and is amazing when you see how quickly your insulin sensitivity can improve from you know that specific strategy. So um, you know again, I feel like this is one of those things where we've got lots of tricks and tools up our sleeve here. So um you know we certainly want to continue to hear from our listeners and have you share with us Again, more of your input, more of your thoughts, questions, feedback, and you can feel free to email us at team at masteringdiabetes.org to um, share or ask questions or, you know, whatever you'd like to um, write in about. <laughs> yeah. If you've come across a favorite recipe or you've got some tips or tricks to simplifying, if you've got a busy household, you have managed to get your kids excited about vegetables or try new fruits, or you've got a partner at home that you never thought would enjoy a salad of any kind, and you figured out how to make a bowl with six different ingredients in it. These are all little things that it, there's there's never there's there's never too simple in some, in some respect where, um, you know, simplify it down. And there's this something I call the microwave chef, just make this a process where you've got a week where you are so busy preparing to travel. You've got all these things going on, get your frozen veggies, get the 90 second bags of barley that you can pop in the microwave. We've got capers and sun-dried tomatoes in our house that get used a lot on everything along with artichokes. Um, Have some things that you know can get you somewhere in a pinch, being able to operate in a pinch with your food. So undoubtedly, you can tell Kylie and I, we are very enthusiastic about um, making it work. But that's just because I think collectively we have 25 years or something of of figuring out how to do plant-based. And the biggest piece of that enthusiasm is encouraging people to think bigger for themselves. Like you're going to feel good. We want you to feel good. Um, we're going to help support you to do that. It's the feeling that is that feeling good is the reason why you stick with something and then having belief in it, believing in it, uh, you know, trusting the process, but it's um, that you don't have to completely reshape your life and overthrow everything you've got going on to be a healthy person. We have to work on blending those worlds together. That's that's how you end up, um, I guess, the, the buying into your own health and f- fueling your own longevity is in that process. So anyway, that's our enthusiasm. I honestly didn't think I would live to see the age that I am today. So um, when I was 22, I did not think that I would would make it through <laughs> the adventures in type one. But um, heck, here, here, here we are. So cool stuff can happen. From- I mean, that is very powerful. And <laughs> you're thriving. Like I'm I all mean- right. I'm all right. 
Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) I see you as a thriving, beautiful human. So, you know, let's just keep you around here as long as possible. (laughs) Thank you, Kylie. I know if everyone, you can't see this, but I'm sitting on the edge of my chair because my cat, you know, the special one, she's pushing me towards the front of this. And what happens is- I know it pinches, it pinches my hip flexors so bad that when I try to stand up, my feet are usually asleep. So oh no, um, this is how I coach okay. a lot of people, by the way. <laughs> On that position. Okay. Well, actually, okay. So that's if, if you want to meet Lauren's cat and um, be coached by Lauren <laughs> in the, at the, on the edge of her seat, <laughs> please also write in to team at masteringdiabetes.org. <laughs> We will um, have her and her cats waiting for you. Um, But we also have a whole team of coaches who you're going to meet soon. We're going to be bringing them on this pod and having them come and talk with us and share. And I mean, we've got a whole team of amazing, amazing people just waiting to help you discover what's possible for you and maybe help you simplify things if that's something that you're looking for. So keep us in mind. (laughs) Yeah, they deserve to be shown off a little. Um, they're so giving, they're so, so, so giving and interesting and have their own really cool stories. So yeah, it's, it's time to get to know the, the beyond mastering diabetes, the above and beyond. Yeah. Awesome. Well, before your feet f- officially fall asleep, we will end here today. Um, but this was so great. Thank you so much for all of your insights and sharing as always. And, um, we will be here next time with, I'm not sure. We've so many ideas of things to talk about, Mm -hmm. but we'll, well, we'll wait, teaser. Can I, I have a teaser in mind. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yay. I love a teaser. Content chocolate. Ooh, (laughs) you know, I love that. I know. I can't wait. (laughs) Okay. Let's do it. (laughs) Okay. All right, everybody have a healthy week. 